Just make sure you don't say anything totally embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, what are you saying? Wait, can you hear me? Eugene, can you hear me? Uh, now it's better. Okay, I was just saying, don't say something embarrassing because there are millions watching you on YouTube. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, I'm sure they are watching you. <laughs> all right, so let's get started. So it's a pleasure to have Eugene Zhu from uh, the Perimeter Institute telling us about his recent work today. So Eugene was actually a PhD student at Harvard officially, but he worked with Sandville. And he has done a lot of interesting work, some of it on the more esoteric side, uh, but actually he was one of the early pioneers of figuring out how to think about band structures for magic angle twisted by Graphy, And he's also done lots of other interesting work. So yeah, the floor is all yours, Eugene. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and the invitation. And uh, thank you all for coming. So uh, it's my great pleasure to tell you about our recent work on non-family quiz. The work was done with Wei Chen and Sansik. I assume you know Sansik. Uh, Wei Chen is a student at the perimeter and uh, he is really a powerful person who was able to carry out very complicated calculations which made Sansek and uh, me, uh, at least me, quite painful to check the calculations. And uh, uh, magically, I didn't find any error in his calculations, even including any sign errors. Okay. Uh, so this is my outline. I will start with a broad introduction uh, of non family By the way, uh, if you have any questions, please just interrupt me and ask. Uh, but I will, let's first look at the uh, conventional methods. Uh, here I'm showing you some experiments from this work. Uh, I'm sure many of you are very familiar, maybe much more familiar with this other work uh, done at Cornell. So let me just talk about this one. Uh, this is a twisted bilayer material. Uh, and. Uh, so for this kind of module material, there's a lot of tuning parameters. We can, for example, we can fix the carrier density and uh, tune the band structure and the um, wave interaction strength by tuning the, by controlling the displacement field. For example, here, this figure shows the resistivity of the system as a function of temperature when the displacement field is tuned. And you can see at low temperature, it follows a T squared rule, which is a signature of uh, conventional metal. There are also many other signatures of conventional metals. And uh, if we summarize all of them together, they can be described by this so-called Fermi liquid theory, which basically says an interacting Fermi liquid is smoothly connected to a non-interacting Fermi gas, uh, which you can think of some non-interacting fermions, uh, they occupy some Fermi C and at low energies, what's important is the, is the Fermi surface and the, the gapless quasi particles around the Fermi surface. So uh, the key concept of the Fermi liquid theory is this Fermi surface and the quasi particles. Uh, there are also some uh, important modifications of an interacting Fermi liquid compared to a non-interacting Fermi gas like the the normalization of the effective mass and so on. Um, but I think these are really the key. So the Fermi liquid theory, as we know, is a very successful theory in explaining many mechanic, mechanical behavior, but it doesn't explain all mechanic behavior. Uh, for example, just in this same device, if you further tune the displacement, disp displacement field uh, to this part, to some particular value, you will see uh, you will have two observations. The first observation is uh, you see something that doesn't quite fit into a Fermi prediction. And uh, furthermore, the particular violation of the Fermi prediction is this uh, t-linear resistivity. So uh, these are violations of the Fermi liquid behavior in the metal and uh, uh, this kind of metal are known as non Fermi liquid. And this is a one example. Here, I'd like to show you some other examples. So uh, this is a heavy fermion compound. And uh, this is the phase diagram 
of poor cupids in these systems, uh, they, they are seemingly some kind of uh, continuous phase transition across which the size of the, it's a continuous phase transition. It seems to be a continuous phase transition between two metals. Uh, and uh, across the transition, the metal, the size of the Fermi surface have a, a sudden jump. And the other transition, there's also some uh, non fermi for the behavior, for example, also the T linear resistivity. So I pick up this, these two particular examples to highlight this phenomena of uh, continuous transition with a sudden jump of Fermi surface size. It, because uh, there may be such transition, we may want to think about how to understand them. And the uh, lateral mechanism, maybe the simplest mechanism, is to imagine some density wave order uh, that onsets at the transition. Then because of the density wave order, the Fermi surface is undergo some reconstruction and uh, the size of the Fermi surface may jump. This is one mechanism, but um, it, uh, and I have to say, even theoretically, maybe the critical dynamics of uh, this uh, kind of transition is not fully understood, but um, we may also imagine some other scenarios, uh, maybe more exotic and in my view, somehow more intrinsic. Uh, this is what I will call deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. So here, instead of uh, considering a transition between two metals, let's first consider another phenomena. Uh, by the way, this is based on some previous work with the banjo. Maybe you have, maybe you know about it, uh, maybe you don't, but let me introduce it anyway. Uh, so let's first consider another uh, problem. Um, that is a continuous phase transition between a firm liquid metal and an insulator. And here I'm assuming this insulator is fully gapped uh, or at most have, even if it's gapless, it at most has some, just some gold snow modes, nothing more exotic. So uh, suppose uh, such a transition can happen. You can see the size of the Fermi surface also jumps from a finite value to zero. Suppose this transition can happen, then we can also imagine a transition between two metals where the uh, Fermi surface sizes jump, jump discontinuously, although the transition is continuous. Uh, and the, the way to consider it is just to, uh, on top of uh, this transition, let's just uh, add another piece of Fermi surface and assume only one of the two pieces of Fermi surface undergoes this transition, but the other remains as a spectator. Then taking the two Fermi surfaces together, um, this Fermi liquid is this metal one with a larger Fermi surface, and this insulator is the metal two with a smaller Fermi surface. So uh, if this can work, then this can possibly work. But can this work? Um, this is actually a rather non-trivial problem. Uh, I think it's fair to say in these papers, a physical mechanism of such transitions has been proposed. I think the physical mechanism by itself is well defined. However, to really understand the nature of the transition, it's important to understand the low energy dynamics. But the low energy dynamics of these critical theories remains unsolved and even until now. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, if we can understand them, that would be good because they may give some uh, important hints for us to understand exotic be um, the pneumatic behavior in cupids and hyperfermions. So uh, those, are two, uh, those are some examples of non fermi liquid matters. Um, but the concept of non fermi liquid is not only important for metals, it's also important for some other systems, like some kind of insulators. Here, I'm showing some data for mainly for this compound, this organic compound is an insulator, but it also has some metallic behavior. Um, for example, at low temperatures, the spin susceptibility basically stays as a constant. It's like a, it's like a Fermi liquid. And, and there are also some other phenomena strange about this insulator. So because of all those phenomena, people propose that maybe this system realizes a quantum spin liquid with a neutral Fermi surface. What that means is in this system, 
uh, there's the phenomena of fractionalization, meaning if we uh, maybe we have some local spin one magnum excitations, but they fractionalize into, for example, a pair of uh, spinon psi and anti spinon psi dagger, which are fermions, uh, and they interact with some emergent U1 gauge field. And if the fermions form a Fermi surface, then it turns out the interaction with the U1 gauge field will turn the entire thing into a non Fermi liquid of the spin ons. So uh, this state uh, conceptually is an insulator of the physical electrons, but we can think of it as a non Fermi liquid of spin ons. So this is an example where the concept of non Fermi liquid is also useful in insulators. Maybe I have to mention, uh, there's some recent data suggesting uh, at, at zero temperature, this system actually doesn't realize this state, but still I think this theoretical proposal is valuable. So uh, non Fermi liquid appears in many places. And uh, of course we would like to have a theory to understand them. Uh, I also mentioned in this talk, terminologies like non Fermi liquid may refer to non Fermi liquid of either the physical electrons or some emergent fermions. Uh, okay, that's the introduction. Now I will review a framework of non Fermi liquids. Again, if you have any question at any time, please just let me know. So, um, there's a, there's a framework of, of non-Fermi liquids. And the key idea here is to couple the Fermi surface with some gapless bosonic modes. Let's try to understand this uh, intuitively without uh, using too much formula. So, uh, but still let's assume the system is described by such a schematic Lagrangian. It doesn't matter what the precise form of Lagrangian is. This is just a schematic and we just want to gain some intuition. So the Lagrangian contains one piece describing the fermions around the Fermi surface and another piece describing some gapless boson modes, which I call A. Now it's written in momentum space. So K is the momentum. And then there's some coupling between them. Uh, so in this formulation, this E can be viewed as the coupling constant. Then you can see because of uh, the presence of uh, this gapless boson, it will mediate some interactions between the fermions. And the one way to visualize it is to think of this Feynman diagram. So uh, it's possible that one fermion comes in, it uh, emits some gapless boson, which is virtual gapless boson, which is absorbed by the other. And the entire process gives us to some scattering process of those two fermions. And the, the momentum transfer of this process is the is K, meaning the um, momentum of the boson. And uh, you see, uh, because of this structure of the kinetic energy of the boson, then this uh, scattering strength or interaction strength scales at one level K squared. So in the low energy limit, where K goes to zero, this interaction strength diverges. It tells us. Uh, the presence of uh, the gapless boson will mediate some rather strong interactions between the fermions. And this may just uh, uh, destroy the well-defined quasi fermionic quasi-particles, make them uh, ill-defined, very short-lived. And then this may give rise to some non fermi liquid behavior, uh, because as we said before, uh, is the presence of fermi liquids are very important in uh, the presence of quarter particles are very important in Fermi liquids. I think there's a question, right? Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, so, I mean, if you're just doing like QED in free space, then you also have an interaction between like photons and electrons, which is a yeah. similar form. So, what um, doesn't give us to any non Fermi liquid? Is, is that a question? So yeah, my question is, do you, would you have the same behavior just in QED? Uh, not, yeah, and that's a good question. It's actually not quite the same. Uh, I'm, I'm hiding something important here, but now that you are asking, let me say. So here I actually also require this A doesn't, the, the fermion bilinear that couples to A is not the density of the fermions. 
if we test the density of the fermions, you know, we are now considering a system with a finite density of fermions. And then there's the phenomena of screening. And uh, that kind of quantum interaction can be screened to be a sh short range interaction. So the quantum interaction, uh, which is due to coupling between some graphics boson with the density, then it effectively becomes short range. But if, if it's not coupled to the density but something else, then uh, it, can, it can still be this kind of non range interaction. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so this is the picture. Uh, let's look at uh, a more precise formula for this. Uh, so we want to have a more precise theory uh, for us theories to work with. Uh, but usually in a system with a Fermi surface, the theoretical problems are difficult, mainly, mainly because there are too many gaps to use freedom. But also in the present scenario, there's a simplification. It comes from some kinematic constraint due to the presence of the Fermi surface. Uh, so let's uh, try to understand it also intuitively. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the key to destroy the quasi particles to obtain a non from liquid is to have some gapless boson. So I want the boson to really be gapless so it can have some very low energy. And okay, now let's see uh, what role it really plays. Suppose here I have a fermion, fermion uh, here around the Fermi surface, it, its energy is very small. Uh, and now suppose I have a boson which is absorbed by this fermion. So uh, let's see what happens. One possibility is that the momentum of the boson is perpendicular to the Fermi surface or parallel to the Fermi velocity. Then you will see after absorbing this boson, the fermion will be kicked away from the Fermi surface and acquire some high energy. And this makes the process not that effective. However, if the boson has a momentum that's almost parallel to the Fermi surface or perpendicular to the Fermi velocity, then you see after absorbing this boson, the fermion is still relatively close to the Fermi surface and uh, remain in the low energy regime. And this um, makes this kind of scatter scattering very effective. What this means is uh, so if I focus on a particular patch on the Fermi surface, then the most important bosons that will mediate strong impact, strong scattering will be the ones that have momenta almost parallel to the Fermi surface. And you usually because we consider an inversion symmetric Fermi surface or time reversal symmetric Fermi surface, then when we consider this patch, for the other patch, the same boson will be important for both of them. This is a one observation. The other observation is as long as, as long as I take this patch to be big enough, then for the fermion to go from one patch to the other, it requires multiple scattering coming from the boson. This also makes the process ineffective. So um, we can ignore the coupling between different patches and uh, only focus or a pair of antipodal patches on the Fermi surface and the bosons with um, momenta that, that, that are um, almost parallel to this, these two patches. So this is the so-called patch theory. Uh, it, uh, this is a, and I just described the intuitive picture and you can find a more serious justification from this paper. And at the end, the effective action for this patch theory takes this form so the action has three terms. The first term describes the uh, fermion. Uh, here you see this fermion besides momentum. This fermion has two indices. This i is a flavor index. So for spin is fermion, i is just one. For spin one half fermion, is, it can be one or two. And for multi-component fermions, it can be other values. Let's be general here. And this p is a patch index. It can be plus or minus representing the two patches. Um, and this term, uh, this term is here is just because we are uh, using the uh, Lagrangian or action formalism, not the Hamiltonian formalism. And this part is the kinetic energy 
of the fermion uh, expanded around the fermion surface. So uh, the first term, uh, the first term is just the usual VFK kinetic energy for the fermion. Uh, VF is said to be one here, and the second term is the is uh, is coming from the curvature of the fermion surface. So this is the one term, and then we have this coupling between boson and the fermion. Uh, this lambda is, is patch dependent, let's say. And then uh, this, this is the action of the boson. Uh, you see uh, here I'm multiplying it by some n. This is the number of flavors. So I can take value from one, two, three, to until n. And I also introduced some other parameter which are called epsilon here. And you can just view it as epsilon. So in the previous slide, epsilon is just one. And uh, in this formulation, this E squared uh, can be viewed as the carbon constant. Any question about this action? Or maybe one thing I should also mention is here you only see KY, this component, but not KX and the frequency. Uh, by the way, K tau is frequency. You must follow frequency. Here you don't see them is because uh, they turn out to be irrelevant. Those terms turn out to be irrelevant on the RG. Actually, a quick question. So yeah. if I have to analyze some very weirdly shaped Fermi C, like a dumbbell kind of thing, and there will be multiple patches whose tangential directions are the same. So I guess I would have to include all of them. I guess so, yeah. At once, right? Okay. So, right? Yeah, I think okay. so. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, this is the effective action that we will be using. Uh, so uh, what's good about this effective action? Uh, What's good about it is uh, this action with this theory allows a uh, control the limit. The control the limit occurs when one of n and epsilon simultaneously go to zero at the same rate, meaning um, n times epsilon is a constant, is, is fixed um, in this limit. This turns out to be a control the limit uh, as studied in this paper. Um, it, so usually it's such a theory of non liquidity is strongly coupled and it's valuable to have some control limit. And the good thing about the previous theory is it has this control limit. And for example, people using this in this control limit, people can do some reliable calculation at least to the leading on to the order. For example, uh, alpha here is just uh, the previous company uh, divided by four pi. For example, the RG flow equation of this alpha takes this form uh, I will use it later. Now I'm just showing you that it can be done. And also uh, various physical quantities are also computed uh, in this paper. But uh, let me emphasize that is to the leading non trivial order. So what about the property of this theory at high orders? Uh, the answer is it wasn't known until our work. Uh, but you may wonder why should I care about high order behavior? Uh, there are some reasons. One reason is um, when, when people say this theory is controlled, it's really saying it's controlled to the leading non trivial order. To establish it's really controlled, you have to go to higher orders. And uh, this wasn't done in this paper. Uh, and more importantly, for my purpose, uh, the initial motivation to study this problem at all uh, is to understand the critical dynamics of deconfined metallic quantum criticality. It turns out, in, at least in my approach, uh, to understand that critical dynamics is necessary to understand the high order behavior of this theory. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. What, what is DMQC? Deconfined metallic quantum criticality. Deconfined metallic, okay. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, nice. Hi. Uh, okay, uh, so this is there's this control uh, limit, and uh, mm, so maybe the meaning of this n is not abstract at all. I already told you what it is is the number of fermion flavor, but maybe you would think the uh, meaning of epsilon is more abstract. Uh, you you may ask what's the physical consequence with the special case where epsilon is equal to zero. Uh, it's actually not 
that uh, a completely artificial limit, it has some physical meaning. It, when epsilon is equal to zero, that defines a state known as marginal Fermi liquid. So this marginal Fermi liquid uh, was initially introduced in the context of cuprates, but later found to be relevant in broader contexts. For example, it's supposed to be related to the hopperly weak state with quantum interaction, which is relevant for uh, quantum hole physics. It's supposed to be related to some exotic continuous metal insulated transition proposed in this paper, and it's supposed to be important uh, for my own theory uh, with the band uh, of deconfined my technique quantum criticality. Because it appears in so many places, and we had better really understand it thoroughly. So what's the usual understanding of this marginal Fermi liquid? Uh, the understanding is roughly as follows. Let's look at the previous figure again. Um, by the way, this figure will appear one more time in this talk. So uh, let's look at this figure again. Uh, previously, uh, as I said, uh, from this figure, we can see the gap is boson will mediate some strong Fermi and Fermi interactions. Uh, here, if I change uh, the kinetic energy of the boson to be k to the one plus epsilon with an arbitrary epsilon, then the interaction strength will be given by this form, one over k to the one plus epsilon. And for the specific case where epsilon is equal to zero, this just becomes one over k. So in the low energy limit, this thing still diverges. It means the uh, quasi particles will still experience some strong interaction. Um, but for this particular case where epsilon is equal to zero, uh, the quasi particles are actually just destroyed marginally in the sense that they, the presence of the uh, boson will just uh, create some logarithmic self-energy correction to the fermion. And then based on this, uh, people uh, have this belief that the marginal fermion liquids are weakly coupled at low energies. And this is uh, also supported by more serious RG uh, analysis. So previously I showed you the beta function for the company. If you plug in epsilon equal to zero, it takes this form. And as you can see, alpha goes to zero at low energies. So uh, the marginal form liquids are supposed to be weakly coupled. But uh, so the, basically you can say this statement is obtained within the patch theory. But is the patch theory really that valid? In particular, uh, in the patch theory, there's a very important assumption saying that the uh, degrees of freedom from different patches are essentially decoupled in the sense of RG. But is this really valid? Um, well, we know at least one scenario where it has to break down. Uh, that is when the system has some pairing stability. Uh, this is because starting from the work of Cooper, we already know that Gapis Cooper pairs can really explore the entire Fermi surface. For example, suppose I have a, a Cooper pair coming from this pair of patches, then it takes nothing for them to go to another pair of patches. It doesn't violate energy conservation, momentum conservation. They can just freely explore the entire Fermi surface. And this is also <laughs> the reason why we have the Cooper instability. So um, patch theory will break down in the presence of pairing stability. So uh, the, then the usual assumption is suppose the system has no pairing stability at all, or suppose we are at an energy scale above the pairing stability setting in, um, then maybe the patch theory is still a good assumption for, for the normal state, uh, in particular for physical quantities that are local in momentum space. This is the usual assumption, but this assumption also suffers from a subtlety. Uh, again, let's look at this figure. Uh, so the four fermions get, here is, it says the interaction strength is one over k to the one plus epsilon mediated by the boson. Previously, we looked at the limit where k goes to zero. Then we see with a smaller epsilon, this whole thing is smaller. So with a smaller epsilon, the quasi particles are less destroyed. However, we can go to the other limit where k is large. In that limit, you will see with a smaller epsilon, uh, this thing is actually larger. So it means with a smaller epsilon, we will have stronger 
scattering, if the scattering has a large momentum transfer, this may indicate uh, with a smaller epsilon, we will have stronger inter-patch interactions. And then it is possible the patch theory will break down with a smaller epsilon. So it's possible, right? Uh, but we want to examine whether this is the case. So how should we test this? Right, right. Pardon, pardon me once again. So the speaking of this marginal Fermi liquid uh, concept, the arisen, the proposal, um, you know, from Vormet all back in the day was that there was a a a bosonic mode with basically no momentum dependence of its propagator. Um, so can you can you comment on that? It will it will always be generated, right? Say it again. I mean, uh, a propagator with absolutely no momentum dependence of the boson, that's highly fine-tuned. Yes, and what will be generated would be uh, an analytic correction like Q squared, right? Yeah, or it may even be gap. If it's gap, then it just mediates some short range interaction, which is harmless. Uh, or it's gapless with some K squared interaction. Um, yeah. So, so so um yeah. so you this would be the epsilon to one limit of your of your theory yeah so then in that case uh that just doesn't describe the margin of liquid. meaning if they want to have the self energy to be logarithmic in frequency and so on have that those properties then i don't think uh, it's consistent to also just to require the Fermi, the bosons to have k squared kinetic energy okay yeah, this, I, I think this is maybe a, an interesting question that we should discuss on offline. Uh, so how should we test whether the patch theory is valid? Uh, so let's ask, uh, let's ask what does it mean to say the patch theory is valid? Here basically, I mean, uh, it's valid if the degrees of freedom from different patches are essentially decoupled on the RG. Uh, if this is the case, then it means as long as my patch is big enough, then if I further increase the size of the patch a little bit, which physically includes more degrees freedom into my patch, this shouldn't change the physical quantities local in uh, deep in my patch sensitively, because uh, I already assume degrees freedom from different patches de essentially decouple. And so physical quantities local in momentum space should be insensitive to the patch size. Or more formally, what this means is the patch size can be taken to infinity by renormalization. So if the patch size cannot be renormalized away to infinity, then the patch theory is invalid. And uh, we will say there were, there's some phenomena known as UVR mixing, which I will define more precisely later. Okay, so uh, let me summarize what I have talked about so far. So I reviewed a framework of uh, uh, that's supposed to work for many non-Fermi liquids. And uh, the key idea of the framework is to couple the Fermi surface with gapless bosonic modes. And uh, based on this framework, there's a patch theory and a controlled expansion that was developed. Um, so there, I, I mentioned some open questions. One is the high order behavior of the patch theory is unknown. And uh, two uh, is more importantly, the, maybe the validity of the patch theory is questionable, especially for this marginal Fermi liquid where epsilon is very small. And uh, we would like to test the validity of the patch theory. Um, and uh, the way we want to do it is to check if the patch size can be normalized that way. So now I will uh, talk about our results. Again, uh, I'm showing you the same effect reaction as before. Uh, just the same thing. But now we would like to focus on the case where epsilon is equal to zero corresponding to the margin of Fermi liquid. And as you said, as you may be aware of, uh, so in such a, in, in, usually in a field theoretic calculation, you will encounter a lot of infinities if you uh, don't put any cutoff. Uh, so here we too also need to put some cutoff. And it turns out for this particular theory, uh, even if the X uh, momentum, uh, even if you don't impose any cutoff for X momentum and for frequency, uh, there's still no divergence. 
uh, the only cutoff you need to impose is just the Y momentum cutoff, uh, which basically corresponds to the size of the patch. I put lambda one. And here I, I will again use the uh, one of n as my expansion parameter. And uh, we did some calculations and uh, found such a result. So here I'm calculating the propagator of self energy of the boson uh, to the order of one over n. Let me mention the boson propagator to the, le to the leading order, the tree level order is actually uh, of order n. So this one over n, relatively speaking, is a one over n squared correction. Uh, that's why the diagram looks so complicated. Uh, let me make some remarks about this result, and then I will explain these points. The first remark is this kind of self energy represents some renormalization of some non analytic term in the action. The second remark is you see, this is a there's this divergence when lambda equals to zero, but it takes the form of a double log unlike the usual logarithmic divergence, it's a double logarithmic divergence. And this kind of divergence, they have argued, cannot be normalized away. Uh, furthermore, the reason for the appearance of this whole thing uh, will be attributed to virtual Cooper pairs and the fact that epsilon is equal to zero. And now let me just explain these points. Yujun, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the previous slide. So if I was, uh, if I work with, you know, some six original chiral theory, which doesn't have the antipodal patches. Yeah. With epsilon equal to zero. Yes. Will all of this go away? Yes. And I will mention it. So there, um, I mean, patch theory works or it doesn't? It works. Okay. At yeah. least uh, it doesn't. So uh, we didn't find a reason, at least we didn't find a reason why it doesn't work. And in fact, as Sansik uh, studied, I think his chiral non fermi liquid is just solvable, yeah. Right? right, but so there, no matter how high in one over n you go, you don't create anything that yeah. I see. Yeah. And later you will see what's the difference between this and that. That's actually related to the third point. And you know, this is obviously one of many diagrams at order one over n, but this is the only one that's what I said. I mean, there's nothing that you know, sort of cancels this away. No, no. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so it, it was a crazy thing to do that. It was quite painful to check that calculation. Uh, uh, so uh, the first uh, point I want to make here is, uh, um, or I should say I want to uh, draw your attention to is, uh, this is uh, this rep this results represent a, a renormalization of some non-analytic term in the action. Uh, usually, uh, non-analytic terms in the action are assumed to be robust in the sense that they are free of renormalization at all. But now I would like to argue uh, it actually can be renormalized if we have a Fermi surface. And the reason is as follows. So let's consider a usual quantum field theory with no Fermi surface, then uh, <laughs> Is there a question? Okay, then uh, we can look at this figure. This means this is the momentum space and uh, only at this point of the momentum space we have some gap is most. And then uh, this quantity, uh, this derivative applies the previous correlation function. So this derivative, what does it mean? It means the contribution to this uh, pi coming from modes in this, energy or momentum window. Now, in the limit where the external momentum is much smaller than the, uh, this cut of lambda, then uh, we know in this case, the correction coming from those high energy modes, those modes are high energy modes, can only be analytic in K, in external momentum. And this is the reason, the usual reason why people think non-analytic terms will be free of renormalization. However, the situation is a bit different if we have a Fermi surface. Again, let's look at this thing. You see, now this der derivative measures the contribution from uh, those windows. And you see those windows include gapless modes. Then it's, it's just possible that the gapless mode will gen generate some non-analytic terms and renormalize them. So uh, with the Fermi surface, this is possible and this folklore may just break down. 
but this is just a possibility. And now I'm just viewing it as a possibility. Uh, and uh, you really have to do the calculation to show it happens. And the second point is uh, this takes the, this normalization takes the form of a double log, double log divergence instead of the usual single log divergence. So usually in the usual QFT without firm surface, uh, you, you, you usually just have this kind of single log divergence. And uh, uh, this, is, this is so um, basically because of the reason in the previous slide, uh, you require d pi d lambda to be analytic in K, then you will see the most severe thing you can get is basically this thing. But this is not very bad because uh, here, although you have this cut of lambda appearing, it can be renormalized away, say by adding a counter term like this. This mu is the renormalization scale. And I add this counter term to my action, then taken together, the total contribution looks like this. You see the, uh, the cutoff disappears. And basically what this means is just uh, the textbook renormalization, renormalizability. Uh, it means now low energy quantities can be expressed only in terms of low energy quantities. And there's no need to involve any high energy data like lambda. So there's a effective decoupling between high energy physics and low energy physics. Now in our case, um, this thing takes the form of a double log divergence. And we can uh, also uh, try to see if it can be normalized away. For example, we add such a kind of term and you see after adding them together, it cannot be normalized away. This lambda will still appear here. And then it means the low energy quantities will, will be sensitive to high energy data. So there's no decoupling between high energy and low energy data. And uh, this is what we mean by UVR mixing. Uh, and also you remember this lambda y is just uh, the size of the patch. Uh, previously we said, if the patch theory is valid, the many degrees of freedom from different patches should be decoupled, then this behavior shouldn't be here. But now it's here, it means the patch theory uh, according to this result actually breaks down. Furthermore, uh, now it is- Is it a good time? Huh? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a similar situation I encountered before. I mean, I'm just talking about double log divergence, you know, and then take it out of the context. So in some cases I see a double log divergence just because it's coming out of a single log divergence and you just keep doing the diagram so you get Log. Oh, that would have sort of the cube and all that. So I guess here you have ways to check that it's not because it's of not that. It's not like that. Um, but maybe uh, uh, in, in case, I think this is a good question, but in case Charmin's question is unclear to some audience, let me uh, rephrase it. So Charmin is basically saying suppose I have some single log divergence, then uh, if I have some complicated Feynman diagrams where some sub diagram is precisely the one that contributes some single log divergence. And then this complicated diagram may have some double log divergence. Yeah, uh, that can happen. But usually, in the usual theory, when that happens, there is a magic. The magic is the coefficients in front of the single log and the double log and the log cube, log to the fourth together, all of them together, they are so nicely arranged such that you can sum them together to give a power log. And this is precisely how you obtain the anomalous dimension. So after summing those logs, you obtain some correction to the power log relation function as the anomalous dimension. Here is not the case. Uh, the coefficients don't match. Uh, now, uh, let me come back to the Benjamin's question. Um, so so I, I want to talk about the origin of this UVR mixing and the uh, in along the way, I will come back to the vengeance question. So uh, there are two ingredients for this UVR mixing. One is what we call the virtual group pairs. Uh, what this means is just uh, those uh, fermion loops that are running in the parallel in, in the same direction. In fact, those two fermion loops are coming from the same from the opposite patches. So they represent Cooper pairs, and they are virtual uh, because they just appear in the loop in the loop calculation of the diagram. Um, so you can ask what happens if I get rid of them. For example, I just flip the 
direction of one of the two loops, then this stop block disappears. Or you can ask if I uh, still keep them in the same direction, but put them into the same patch, then it also, stop block also disappears. And uh, uh, coming back to the vengeance question, if I just don't have the other patch at all, uh, this also disappears. So uh, it's really coming from this virtual couple pairs. But just having the virtual couple pairs is not enough. Uh, we also need to have uh, this marginal exponent with epsilon equal to zero, uh, which makes the large momentum scattering just marginally surprised. Uh, if epsilon is larger, remember we had the previous picture saying with a larger epsilon, uh, larger, uh, larger momentum scattering will be further surprised. Then if epsilon is larger, the double uh, result is replaced by this. You don't really have to read it through. Uh, the information I try to convey here is one, and there's no divergence in lambda y to the infinity limit. And there's just no divergence at all. So there's no UVR mixing. Uh, two, this actually represents some kind of renormalization of some effective epsilon. And uh, this epsilon, it turns out it grows on the RG. Uh, if you interpret it in this way, then it mean, uh, and remember epsilon is supposed to be the control parameter of the expansion. Then this also means the control expansion breaks down. And uh, there are also some other consequences of this UVR mixing. So, uh, so, uh, the, our result actually forces us to view this lambda y not just as some usual cutoff, but as a coupling constant of the theory. So usually you don't view such a thing as a coupling constant, right? And you view it as a cutoff. But now the physical meaning of this lambda y is really not just the coupling and the cutoff, it also measures how many gapless degrees of freedom we have in the theory. It precisely measures this. So uh, it's also reasonable to view it as a coupling constant. In fact, we are kind of forced to, um, because if, if we do this, say we define this dimension as a version of this lambda y, then uh, suppose we don't do it. Then if we look at the beta function, you see uh, the beta function of the coupling uh, in the previous case, without going to this order, we just have the first term, but now we have the second term as well. So uh, the beta function involves the cutoff explicitly but if you just interpret it as a carbon constant, and then this is just some other carbon constant, and we have a couple of beta functions of the two carbon constants. Um, so what does the, these beta functions predict? Uh, it predicts the following. Uh, so um, suppose at some energy scale mu, uh, I have some initial value of alpha, and then uh, if alpha is very small, uh, it turns out the first term will dominate, and uh, then uh, this term will try to make alpha smaller and smaller eventually to zero. But if alpha is larger and not enough, then the second term will win, and what happens is uh, it will eventually flow to the strong company regime in which we use analytical control. Uh, and uh, you see there's a separation between the weak company regime and the strong company regime. Uh, furthermore, as you know, at the energy mu, uh, this uh, weak coupling regime shrinks to zero. Uh, so this is a, a bit different from the usual expectation of the weak coupling nature of the margin of the liquid. Uh, so it's not that weakly coupled. It also has a consequence in terms of the scaling structure of various things. Suppose we talk about the Fermion spectral function as a function of frequency, momentum, and temperature then it usually is assumed to be to take a form uh, of this, but without the red part, only the black part. So in that case, um, this third has some critical exponent and F is some um, universal function. And this K parallel is the deviation of K from the Fermi surface. And this is some other uh, critical exponent, but all result, uh, it means uh, you actually also need to include another argument in the, uh, in the skinny function. And uh, in particular, uh, this Fermi momentum will enter into this argument. Okay. Are you, before you go on, just something confusing. So that first RG equation for lambda tilde, can't you just integrate that and get lambda is exponential in L? Yeah. 
Okay, but then you plug that into log of lambda tilde on the other equation, and you just get L. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a uh, an inhomogeneous, or it's like a uh, it's it's not you know time trans uh, RG time translation invariant the the equation for alpha is that right? Okay. Um, okay. I thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Basically, I'm, I'm almost done now. Let me summarize. Uh, so we have found some UVR mixing in using the patch theory of the marginal Fermi liquid, and, and at the end it turns out uh, to indicate some breakdown of the patch theory and the contract expansion, and it has various phenomen phenomenological consequences. Uh, and uh, the reason of the UVR mixing is one, uh, the virtual pairs, two, the uh, marginally suppressed natural momentum scattering. Uh, this is in two plus one D. You can also ask whether it can happen for three plus one D. Say you just set up the same model for a three plus one D system, uh, also with some tunable epsilon. Then it turns out uh, in those case, in those cases, uh, the same type of UVR mixing will occur as long as epsilon is uh, smaller or equal to one. So the case where epsilon is equal to one is the case where the uh, boson has a kinetic energy k squared. And uh, that is relevant to some quantum spin liquids and some mixed valence insulators. Uh, but there are also some important subtleties in our study. One is we, in our study, we didn't include the four main interactions, which should be included. Um, it's usually not included in the patch theory because under the patch theory is RG irrelevant, but um, it can be more subtle than that. Uh, also, uh, all, all results suggest the scattering, the large momentum scattering is important. Then it suggests uh, we should not just use a coupling constant to characterize the coupling between both and the fermion. Maybe we should use a momentum dependent coupling function uh, to characterize this boson fermion uh, interaction vertex. Uh, and uh, that, that, that coupling function may have some non-trivial dependence in momentum and uh, you, on the functional RG, it may flow to some universal functional form. Um, and to really understand the whole thing, uh, we have to include or that's uh, to be honest, like complicated, but maybe that's the, maybe that's the fact. Uh, thanks. That's what I want to talk about. Other questions for Lujan? I'm of sure course. Sam has a question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could help me uh, translating this into, into the Fermi surface language rather than the patch language. So um, the, um, the boson fermion vertex, you know, from a, a full fermion a full Fermi surface perspective simply cannot be uh, cannot be just a constant because otherwise you sort of have to fine tune that you know you're it, you'll not be at a, any sort of quantum critical point you'll be at you know uh, do you mind uh, if is locking my door can I just tell him to come later sorry I I, I missed that what did you say someone is locking my door can I just tell him to come later uh, just a little oh. okay so um so yeah so you know there the you can have standard form you know this the boson fermion vertex ah. and its momentum dependence yeah. is follows from the symmetry of whatever actual physical yeah. mode you're talking about yeah. so can you comment on how that you know that physical thing yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. would enter yeah yeah so uh so uh, this involves physics at different scales. At a very high scale, we uh, need to use the symmetry, like the lattice rotational symmetry, to uh, make the coupling uh, have a consistent form factor. And uh, then what happens is, uh, uh, after that, we want to go to lower energy. And uh, then it may or may not be important that the form factor is important. It, it may so it's, 
So it's conceivable to imagine a scenario where uh, different patches can decouple. Then the form factor, uh, it, it will have some non-trivial profile, but usually it's just the constant part, the momentum independent part for a sufficient, for some appropriate, appropriately large uh, patch to be important. For some patches, maybe it's this um, company, for some other patches, it's some other company, but the momentum dependence within the patch is not that important. Uh, and uh, what I was talking about is uh, even uh, th there's no choice, there would be no choice of the size of such a patch in which the momentum dependence is unimportant. Right. So the, the maximum you can expand, so say, say we have an L equals two, you know, pneumatic uh, uh, type symmetry of our bosonic mode. The fact that the coupling constant is opposite under 90 degree is odd under 90 degree rotation puts a hard limit on, you know, on the real size that you can make these patches, right, without having a uh, sort of a, um, you know, a qualitative change. Does that, so for instance, do you know how a, would a, is there, are there, would there be any clear effects from doing a, you know, a four patch theory with these opposite coupling constants? Uh, I doubt it. Hello? I mean, I doubt it. Maybe okay. not that important. Um, okay, because it would require some, it would, in order for them not to decouple, you'd have to, you'd have to scatter at that, you know, KF over root two or something, um, 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 momentum scale. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so let's view the patch, uh, construction as an assumption, uh, and then this assumption is saying uh, we can, in this step, we can just uh, first uh, decouple different patches and uh, assume, uh, say, different patches have different couplings and then study them separately. Now, in the second step, we start, we think about the uh, coupling between different patches. Uh, I think the usual belief, even for the asymptomatic case, is uh, for uh, this pair and this pair, uh, for these two perpendicular pairs, uh, you, the user belief is you can, I don't know if I should say the user belief, uh, especially in front of you, if there's some- No, <laughs> don't, don't worry, I, I won't be mean. <laughs> there's some belief uh, that you can just study them separately and then add them together in some harmless way, but uh, it, it's possible that this doesn't happen. It needs to be seriously scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering more broadly, like how to translate the patch language into a Fermi surface language and, you know, talk about actual phenomenology that would result from your, uh, from this, you know, these considerations and what you've found out. Mm. Mm. So suppose uh, there's no this UVR mix and then uh, the statement uh, it's just uh, we can first uh, consider different patches and then just uh, add physical quantities together in some harmless way. But now uh, there is such UVR mixing. Uh, a lot of things need to be understood uh, before, before adding things up. Okay, so for instance, the fermion self energy. Yeah. Um, the does it have the the marginal fermi would it have the marginal fermi liquid form under your calculations of having you know a real part that's linear in frequency and an imaginary part that's logarithmic to this order it does <laughs> to and which order are we at again it's a high order isn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah it's one of them squared order okay well that's that's cool. Sorry, uh, Lujan, I missed that. So even with this one over n mod ky that you had, and if you feed that back in, you still get the same omega log omega. Yeah, two uh, two one over n squared. I see. Okay. The fermions are somehow it's harder to see it. I see. Okay, I think uh, we have had quite a few questions. So. Uh,
let's thank Legion one more time. Oh, thanks. Uh, the manager, uh, do you mind me asking you a quick question? Oh, for asking me? Yeah. Uh, should, should we start streaming the interview? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I actually wanted to ask about your experiment. Uh, I know. So this uh, is not my experiment, it's my experiment. <laughs> <laughs> my experiment. So in your experiment at the micro insulated transition point, the resistivity uh, decreases as the temperature increases. Uh, how should I understand that? <laughs> That's fine. He's not asking anything embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's uh, I mean, clearly, this aspect is very different across the two experiments. Yeah. Uh, Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so, the question is, so the manager did an experiment here. Uh, <laughs> he, so there's a metal insulated, continuous metal insulated transition. It's continuous. Uh, it's naturally continuous because there's a very beautiful scanning collapse experimentally. And uh, however, when you go to the transition point, you see uh, the resistivity scales with temperature as key to the negative 1.3, according to the paper. Uh, even if it's not negative 1.3 exactly, it decreases with temp as temperature increases. I was asking how I should understand it. So there's a, a strong homerange effect very close to the transition on the mechanics side. Probably in my first. Where you heat it up, but the thing gains a lot of entropy. Uh, so, is it possible that transition is driven by disorder? Very close to the critical point, disorder might be, I mean, it depends on what you mean by disorder. Yes, the sort of long lived disorder might be important. I mean, even the transition is driven by disorder. I don't think, I mean, at least I don't think that's the leading thing, given everything else. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, they have um, compressibility, magnetic susceptibility, transport state, the activation gap uh, goes to zero very cleanly. And the actual, like, at half spinning, the actual electron density is much. Larger by at least four orders of magnitude than the characteristic disorder density in their samples. So, you know, interestingly, if anything, I think the Columbia samples are somewhat more disordered. Mm -hmm. the, the resistivity, though, has to diverge at low temperature if you're sitting right at a continuous metal insulator transition, right? Because on, on one side, you have an infinite zero temperature resistivity and the, the other ha side you have zero or, or finite in any case. I mean, there, right? there can be some leftover residual resistivity due to the static disorder. And right, right. On, on the metal side, yes, residual resistivity. But right between, you're going from finite to infinite, and it makes sense that you would diverge uh, as a function of temperature, right? Uh, no. At zero temperature, there can be a jump, which is of the order of r of a over e squared. Ah, uh, okay, right, right. Um, which, uh, in all fairness, the experiments don't actually see. Okay, I think the rest can be an informal offline discussion. No, but, yeah, it's. Uh, I realize it's out of my control. I just, I accidentally closed my computer and pumped myself out of being a host. Um, so apparently Kevin is host and I asked him to stop the streaming. I don't I'm stopping yet. So you can I can end the meeting. Oh I I will yeah, the only option for me is to leave myself. <laughs> oh sorry about that. I uh, I didn't see your I didn't see your oh, no, okay. Um, uh, yeah, could you stop the streaming? Yeah, uh, sure. Maybe, like, give me my host or whatever. So. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you a little bit more. So. Oh, okay. But, yeah. But okay, so I'm, I'm actually not, yeah, I'm not sure how to it. I'm not sure how to stop the streaming. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll right. just try to make you host. Oh, uh, yeah, you can make me host and see what I can do. <laughs> oh, my.
Okay, you should be the host 